Okay, I think we're we're set here. So welcome everybody and good evening and thank you especially to uh, Barbara and Brooke for inviting Sigrid and I to present tonight. I'm excited to share an update on the work of a small group of passionate, creative and incredibly dedicated volunteers. It has been my privilege to serve with called the Fungal Diversity Survey or Fundus for short. I, we're gonna talk about, I will talk about community science and fungi, the evolution of fundus and our new name and focus on conservation. And then Sigrid's gonna describe our two new conservation focused programs. And finally, I'll say a few words about our future plans. So I thought it was really fitting that we're giving this talk on Earth Day. The original Earth Day in 1970 marshaled the tactics of the civil rights and anti-war movements of the 1960s to address shocking environmental pollution. And one of today's greatest challenges is also shocking. Species are going extinct at rates comparable to the great extinctions in geological time, but now due to human causes. And Fundus wants to be a part of the solution for the great kingdom fungi. So post a chat if you participated in the first Earth Day in 1970. So Fundus is, our mission is to increase, increase scientific knowledge and public awareness of the critical role of fungi in the health of our ecosystems and to better utilize and protect them in a world of rapid climate change and habitat loss. And we do this by equipping community scientists working with professional mycologists with the purporting tools to document the diversity and distribution of fungi across North America. So what is this community science? We're a community science project. It simply means scientific research conducted in whole or in part by volunteer non-professional scientists. But community science is, is a movement that's exploded in the last decade or two in many fields of science due largely to widely available technology that allows volunteers to record and share data like mobile phones and the internet. And it's especially suited and I would say needed for tasks that are labor intensive and geographically dispersed like documenting fungal diversity, which we're here to talk about. So historically, all mycology was done by amateurs. But more recently, there, a grassroots movement has been growing among millennials and younger folks that focuses on applied human-focused aspects of mycology, sometimes called DIY or do-it-yourself. And much of this interest can be traced to Paul Stamets, whose 28, 2008 TED Talk has been viewed at least 7 million times. And people in this community are heavy users of social media, especially Facebook and Instagram, which I'll mention in a moment. And I, I, I bring this up because the applied mycology movement uh, is first, it's how many young people are getting interested in fungi today. Uh, second, the conservation mycology, which is what we're talking about tonight, is a new applied field. And finally, if there's any hope for documenting fungal diversity at the scale needed, we're going to need all hands on deck. So NAMA played an important early role, as Brooke mentioned earlier, uh, in the community science of fungal diversity with the voucher collection project. And this project documented and stored thousands of voucher specimens at the Field Museum from at least 22 national forays over more than two decades as shown in this map. And it was ably led during most of that period by Patrick Leacock shown here and is now led by Andy Wilson in Denver. So Facebook and Instagram provide valuable social connection and help with mushroom identification for hundreds of thousands of mycophiles. But Fundus uses iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer 
because unlike social media platforms, photos and metadata uploaded to INAT and MO, as we call them, are data-based, which means that they're searchable and therefore usable for scientific research. So how did Fundus get to where we are today? In 2012, UC Berkeley mycologist Tom Bruns had some leftover grant funds and convened a day-long workshop at Yale University to explore what it would take to create a funga, then called a mycoflora, of North American macrofungi, which are just fungi big enough to see without a microscope. The meeting included both professional and amateur mycologists, the latter organized by NAMA. And Tom Brun suggested that it would require something like $18 million to hire the academics just to start creating the fungi. But there was, of course, never any hope of raising that kind of money for fungal taxonomy. So four years ago, 2017, Steve Russell and I spearheaded the rebooting of Bruns's vision for an all-volunteer community science enterprise re retaining the original name. Our focus was on documenting, sequencing, and vouchering fungal specimens. A major accomplishment, I think, was inspiring and engaging hundreds of amateur mycologists across North America to register projects and learn how to scientifically document fungi. At last count, we have 198 registered projects. And most projects are place-based. And sponsoring organizations are diverse and include clubs, civic, educational, and government organizations, and national parks and nature reserves. There are also projects focused on specific mushroom taxa and a creative historical project, and one focused on documenting the phenology of mushrooms in a Brooklyn cemetery. And that project, incidentally, was organized my, by my co-presenter and was written up in the New York Times just last week. So let me hide this thing. There we go. Um, so here's a map of the projects, 198, and they're all across North America from Alaska to Puerto Rico and Greenland to Hawaii. So while we were in NAMP, uh, 600, six, uh, 6,500 specimens were documented and barcoded or sequenced. Um, about 5,000 of those were from NAMP registered projects and NAMA forays with many specimens vouchered. Funding for sequencing grants was provided by your organization, NAMA and MSA, while many other sequences were paid for out of pocket by clubs and project leaders. NAMP also sponsored the 2019 Continental Michael Blitz, which was funded by a National Geographic grant to Kathy Aim at Purdue University. And Kathy spent a good part of the pandemic personally sequencing, analyzing and posting almost 1500 DNA sequences because her lab staff was shut out of the, the building. And no, that's not the right way. Um, so in 2020, we rebranded our organization as the Fungal Diversity Survey. And why did we do this? Well, we rebranded partly to reflect the fact that fungi are their own kingdom or queendom and have been recognized as such for at least half a century by all scientists. In fact, modern DNA evidence shows that fungi are more closely related to animals than plants. And we also wanted to expand our mission beyond just barcoding to documenting fungal diversity for conservation, I should point out. So what have we accomplished since last August when we became Fundus? We're now using a commercial lab called Barcode of Life in, or BOLD in Guelph, Ontario. And we're still using funds received by MS, from MSA and NAMA for grants for sequencing 
but those funds are now almost gone. A big difference this year is that we have two professional volunteer mycologists, Jean Lodge, who's asleep, and Biddy Roy, who's on this call, uh, screening and analyzing the DNA sequences coming out of Bold. Uh, we currently sent in about a thousand amateur collected specimens to Bold for sequencing, and about half of those have come back, and Gene and Biddy have analyzed 405 of them as of yesterday. And of those 405 sequences, Gene and Biddy have determined that 22 are new to science, undescribed species. That's 6% of the successful sequences. It's pretty remarkable. This is a table list of the 22 new species and their collectors, several of whom I see are on this call. Uh, Gene and Biddy have contacted experts for each of these taxa and done some literature research and are confident that these are really new to science. Pretty exciting. Um, Biddy is going to be available, uh, stay on for the Q&A afterwards. So if you have questions about this, uh, she can perhaps answer them. So these are the the amateur community scientists who collected these new species. And for my money, this really shows the power of amateurs working with professionals. So there's still a huge amount of work to do after what Biddy and Jean are doing. They're vetting basically and analyzing, but to research the literature and formally describe, name and publish even a single new species and actually only one of the 22 new species you just saw or in that list has gotten to the point, that point so far. And that's this Calibliopsis collected by Fred Rhodes near Bellingham, Washington. It's been described and is in press. I'll show you some of the finds so you can get an idea of what these community scientists have found. Here are some of the more colorful new species. And here are some less colorful new species. And here are some really dark new species. This is just uh, a little more than half of the 22. So there's also some more species that are rare like these two or, or significant range extensions. So this is what an observation looks like on iNaturalist, this one collected by Steve Ness. Note that iNat has no way of dealing with a species that has not been formally named. So it uses the species name closest to the new species. And in this, as in uh, Hygrosopy F mucronella, which means the F means close to, but it's not the same species. And here's another INAT record for which there is no close sequence in GenBank, but it needs more work to determine if it is a new species. This could be a described and named species that just hasn't been sequenced, as are many old specimens sitting in Fungaria. So uh, for our next incarnation, fungus will focus on fungal conservation. And why fungal conservation? Because fungi are extremely important to life on Earth. They're overlooked compared with plants and animals, and many are undoubtedly threatened with extinction. The first step in protecting fungi or anything is understanding how important it is. This passage at the beginning of Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, eloquently sums it up. He says, fungi are everywhere, but they are easy to miss. They are inside you and around you. They sustain you and all that you depend on. They are eating rock, making soil, digesting pollutants, nourishing and killing plants, surviving in space, inducing visions, producing food, making medicines, 
manipulating animal behavior and influencing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. You know, after reading this, who wouldn't want to protect fungi? So you're probably familiar with how important fungi are for people, both good and bad, especially as food and medicine. And I'm not going to bore you with a list of all the functions that uh, Sh Merlin Sheldrake enumerated and all the functions and uses of fungi. I'll just mention one category, drugs, that highlights what's really the essential nature of fungi as metabolic wizards, as Sheldrake put, puts it. Fungi are metabolic wizards that secrete an amazing diversity of chemicals that we've just barely begun to tap. Penicillium is used as an antibiotic and in cheese production, and now in a third generation contraceptive pill. Well, who knew? Antibiotics are the result of fungi fending off bacteria during hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And we're not sure why psilocybin evolved, but it's proving to be a blockbuster drug in psychiatry. Fungi are also important for the planet because they provide critical ecosystem services. They are the primary decomposers of dead plants, especially trees that allow nutrients to be recycled. They help the majority of plants obtain nutrients and water, among other services, and they're really important for soil health. Fungi have been overlooked relative to plants and animals, and that's evident in the fact that fewer than 5% have even been described. Compare that with animals and plants. We're probably losing them faster than we can describe them. And the bottom line is this, it's hard to protect what you don't know exists. Now, since the importance of fungi is not sufficiently appreciated in our society, and most have not been described, it's not surprising that fungi have been overlooked in conservation. This chart shows the pathetic number of fungi, 56 in 28, in, as of 2018, that had merely been assessed for the global red list of threatened and endangered species. Consider this, between one and two out of every five plant species, that's 20 to 40%, are estimated to be threatened with extinction. And almost all plants depend on fungal symbionts. So what are the chances that plant extinctions will impact fungal diversity? It's pretty high, I'd say. The previous graphic described global red lists. A few countries, especially in Europe, have published country level red lists. Note the absence of a national red list in the United States. Guys, we need to change that. So the third thing is, is that they're threatened. Despite their importance to people in the planet, many fungi undoubtedly are threatened with extinction. Even if we don't know all the, we can't just have described all the species. And they're threatened by many of the same forces affecting other living organisms. In Europe, where they've done the most research, uh, at least 10% of macrofungi are threatened with extinction, mainly due to changing land use and increasing nitrogen deposition. So the main challenge is lack of data. We lack the minimum information needed to predict the probability of species going extinct. This includes geographic distribution, population size, change in population size over time, and information on threats. The map shows millions of community science observations for one bird species on the eBird platform. It's the gold standard for conservation data, data gathering. I'm not suggesting that we can do this for fungi anytime soon, but it shows the potential of big data and crowdsourcing. But if you know a billionaire who wants to do for fungi what eBird does for birds, please send them our way. The lack of data on fungal diversity and distribution is where community scientists come in. 
community mycologists are the only hope for documenting at scale what species occur, where, and when, and how these patterns are changing. So Fundus's board adopted an ambitious goal and a strategy to address this opportunity. The goal is to mobilize community scientists working with professional mycologists to bring fungi to the conservation table on a par with plants and animals. Our strategy is to spread awareness of the need to protect fungi and give people tools to contribute. So to tell us how Fundus plans to give people the tools to contribute, I'm gonna turn the mic over to my esteemed colleague, Sigrid Jacob. Uh, yes, thank you so much, Bill. Um, so lofty words, lofty words. Um, how do you actually do something about fungal conservation? That's the challenge. Um, so we found ourselves sort of sitting around in September, um, September last year and going like, what can we, you know, reasonably do to make a difference? Us being a small cash poor organization um, without, um, you know, without the resources of like an eBird. The first thing we did is we assembled a, a rock star team of um, fungal conservationists, um, both uh, community scientists. Uh, you'll recognize some of the names, Elsa Berlinga, Greg Mueller, Biddy Royers in the audience, Ruth Vandegrift, Rick, uh, Django Grobmeyers, and so on and so on. And we had, you know, all these great people sitting around the table and we went like, what can we do? Um, you know, we were in the middle of a pandemic, the forests were burning in California, and we wanted to make a meaningful difference. So we looked around and we looked at what some other people had done in fungal conservation in other countries. And one of the projects that we've always really, really liked was the Lost and Found Fungi Project in, in the UK. And that was a project that ran, I think, up until last year for five years. Um, and they generated a list of 100 rare species and they engaged community scientists to look for them. Um, some of them were the rediscoveries of species long thought extinct, some were never found, but it was a fascinating project. Um, the thing, the big difference between them and us is like they had um, 686,000 uh, uh, British pounds, uh, we had zero. Uh, we also looked at Fungi Map Australia, that's a project that's been around for 20 years. It's always focused on 100 common species, um, so, and they've been tracking them religiously over the last 20 years. It's also engaged community scientists to look for common fungi. They had uh, 100,000 Australian dollars in salaried personnel. Okay, so we, we tried to do something like that, but on a total shoestring. So this is what we came up with. Um, we called it the Fundus Rare 10 West Coast uh, uh, Challenge. It ran for five and a half months, kicked off in October last year, just finished end of March. Um, and the, the project, uh, the purpose of the project was twofold. First of all, we wanted to find out if we could even get people to give a damn about uh, fungal conservation. Because mostly when you mention the words fungal conservation to people, you get a blank stare. It's just not on most people's radars. Um, the second thing we wanted to do is like, could we actually engage amateurs to make scientifically, scientifically valuable observations of rare or, red, or threatened fungi and generate valuable distribution data and detailed habitat information to support conservation? It was a pilot because honestly, you need like longitudinal data for that kind of stuff to really make an impact. But the only way to, to find out if this could even work was to let it run for six months and then take a look at it and decide. So it just finished, so we have the benefit of some of the results. So here is the fungi that we focused on. It's a total mix uh, of species. We, we've got a coral fungus, we've got an ascomycete, we've got gastromycete, um, we've got two polypores and a bunch of gill uh, mushrooms, and we chose them to represent different habitats, different geographies, all up and down the, uh, the west coast from Alaska uh, to California, different seasonalities within within those zones, different form groups. Some were extremely rare, um, like the uh, Lebiota ludiophila. Some of them were a little bit more common because we wanted people to give a chance to find at least one of them. Um, and they were all easy to identify without a microscope. So, you know, little brown mushrooms were definitely not uh, something we could do to people because, you know, we drive ourselves and everybody else crazy. So we try to make them sim simple and easy to find. Um, so here's a little preview of the results. Um, 
but the first thing I want to sort of say, like this is a really beautiful example of community science. And some people call it citizen science, some people call it community science, and we firmly come down on calling it community science for the simple reason that it takes a community to do that kind of thing. It doesn't just take one person working in isolation, it takes a village to get this project off the ground and to make it successful. It took all these people here on this list. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a community effort, it has to be. Um, the results, we found seven of the 10 target species, and we're gonna go over some of them in just a minute. 91 observations, 62 finders. We saw two major range, ex range extensions and some smaller ones. We got 20 vouchers for all the seven species, some very detailed habitat descriptions, and an increased awareness of the need for fungal conservation. So let's dive in. Uh, so this is what 91 observations look like. Um, there's a lot of brown, a lot of yellow, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of different observations, uh, all sort of um, either on iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer. Um, and what we did for every single find is we like logged detailed, detailed data. And that meant like reaching out to every single observer and getting additional habitat information. Some people actually went back to the original habitats to get more information on the host, the substrate and all that kind of stuff, geolocation. Um, and so on, because the more information you have for a rare fungus, you know, the more valuable the observation becomes. So I, I can tell you it's highly labor intensive. Um, it was all done on volunteer labor. Um, and we piped that data to an organization called NatureSurf. And what NatureSurf does with this is they uh, share that data with uh, conservation organizations and with land managers. So it gets used, it's valuable data to them. Um, so we didn't find three of the 10 species and that in itself is also interesting because uh, we knew that hundreds of people were out looking for these and uh, the fact that Lepiota, Ludiophila, Romeria, Purpurissima and Volvariella serecta weren't found tells us that these mushrooms are indeed quite rare. So it's going to take several years of longitudinal observation to see, you know, if we can find them at all. That's, you know, interesting. Um, so let's talk about some of the things that we did find and this ugly ass mushroom is called Dictyocephalos attenuatus. It gets like a foot and a half high. It smells of fish. It's a mushroom only a mother could love. Um, and uh, it's rare. It usually only gets found in Channel Islands and occasionally in Arizona or maybe Nevada. Um, so somebody actually found it in Wyoming. So that's a massive, massive range extension up to the west, uh, up to the north and up to the east. And the way that that person found it is like they had a property in Wyoming, uh, Arlen and his wife, Katie, were driving around and they found this weird thing sticking out of an anthill. And they went like, what the hell is that? And spores came out and they thought like, maybe it's a mushroom. So they shared with a mushroom loving friend that friend posted it um, in, uh, in a mushroom Facebook group and somebody there remembered our challenge and encouraged them to post it on a naturalist where we finally found it. And we got a sequence and it's, um, there's only two sequences in GenBank and we now have three sequences. Um, so it was like a wonderful discovery that kind of changed how we look at this oddball of a mushroom. Um, the second uh, mushroom I want to talk about is the Pachycodonia spatulata. Um, and that one's really interesting because we thought it was really rare. It typically only gets found like once or twice a year. There were only two sequences in GenBank. It grows under Manzanita duff. And it turns out that it's actually much more common if you, um, if you make the effort to turn over the duff and poke around a little bit. And people actually went out and looked at uh, Manzanita habitats and they decided to look for this mushroom. And, it turned, and they found 20. 20 different collections, um, so it's much more common. We found three new areas. Uh, we rain, range extended it to the north and to the south. Um, so once again, it really made a difference for this particular species. And then there's this beautiful little hygrossa bee that has yellow gills. It's called hygrossa bee flavifolia. Um, and we didn't find any more of it than in previous years. Actually, we found a, a little bit less than is normal, but the highest it was ever found was in Mendocino, and suddenly somebody finds it in Washington. That's like 700 miles further north, so it's like the world's largest range extension right there, um, and that was really exciting as well. And then one last thing, it's this weird amanita. It's a non-mycorrhizal amanita called Amanita pruidii, um, and it typically gets found once a year. 
Uh, it was actually found twice during the pilot, uh, once in an area where it had, had been found before um, up in Oregon, and the second time in a really busy park next to Lake Merritt in Oakland, um, like right next to a bunch of picnickers. So, you know, you just never know where and when you're going to find these rare fungi. Um, so there's all these interesting stories uh, that, that came with these observations. Um, just a little bit more about the challenge. Um, Rue Vandergrift is not just a, a, a well-known mycologist. He's also a beautiful graphic designer. He pulled together these lovely pamphlets that you could print out or you could download onto your phone. Um, Elsa Villinga and Biddy Roy wrote very detailed uh, sort of descriptions, some of it quite funny. Um, so we produced these beautiful booklets and people use them a bunch. Uh, we did a lot of social media work. We posted on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and all that. Um, we also celebrated our finders because every single find represents a human story as well, like the decision to go on an outing, a surprise, um, and so on. So to sort of inspire people to do more of this, we really focused on our finders. Um, and, uh, and then people posted about it, like once we sort of lit the spark, once we lit the fuse, people began posting about the challenge and it kind of became a bit of a craze towards the end where people definitely made a special effort to go out and look for these fungi. Um, and uh, we did a survey amongst, our, uh, amongst the challenge participants, uh, the, the people who've actually found fungi. And it, um, you know, we asked them bunches of questions and one of them was about their age. And it turns out there's a beautiful spectrum of ages. It was very evenly distributed from the very young to the somewhat older, um, you know, and it was geocachers, it was birders. Uh, it was, you know, a broad variety of people that contributed uh, their discoveries to the, to the challenge. Um, we asked people, did this challenge make you more aware of the need to document rare and threatened fungi? And 59% of people said yes, another 30% said they already were very aware. So it seems like we made a dent on that metric. Um, we also asked them whether they are a member of a mushroom club and, and just under half of them were. So we were also reaching people who are not typically, you know, people who are, you know, members of club, which is, which is good because we try to appeal to a broader audience. We didn't just want to sort of speak to the hardcore uh, microfile. We wanted to bring new people um, into, into the fold and we did outreach into nature societies as well, like uh, native plant societies. So we really tried to make it something that everybody could be looking for and could get involved with. Um, and then finally, we asked them, you know, how interest, interested would you be in participating in another challenge? And the vast majority of people said, yes, absolutely. Um, but we also asked, like, would you be willing to revisit the site? Because longitudinal data is so important. Would you be willing to re revisit the site in, in upcoming years? And 85% uh, want to do that. So we definitely want to sort of encourage people to go back over and over and over again and see if they can document these fungi every year. That's part of our next steps. Um, so was it a success? We think so. We were very happy with the outcome because we had no idea whether this would work or not. A lot of mushroom clubs were on hiatus so we couldn't get them as engaged as we wanted to. Um, so, you know, uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to roll out another challenge in the Northeast. It's going to be 20 species. It's going to start the summer. It's going to last for three to five years, but we might be mixing it up a little bit, adding new fungi. Um, so the details will be revealed very soon, but uh, there's already a bunch of excitement. And there's other people that want to run challenges in Florida and Alaska. So there's, there's a bit of a groundswell of enthusiasm for these challenges because it makes conservation really tangible. It makes it real and it makes it sort of accessible to the average person. It's not just an abstract concept. Um, so that's one thing we did. And the other thing we did was uh, the fund, uh, Fundus Fungal Diversity Database. And it's a database within a database. It's actually sort of housed within iNaturalist. And uh, let me explain why. Uh, because obviously you could say like, well, iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer are already this amazing database that's got so much great data. It's image rich, it's geotagged, it, it's all this distribution data. It's like eBirds for fungi. And with all these sort of observations, we could unlock new insights about fungi, we could inform environmental impact assessments and so on. So why do you need a database within a database? Uh, the, the reality of these uh, platforms is that not every single observation is great. You know, uh, I want to say 
being a sort of frequent user of the platform that maybe half of all observations are poor they're not uh, they're misidentified or they're not identified the picture isn't detailed they're not showing the underside they're not showing the vulva um, the, the mushroom is old the mushrooms immature and so on so it's a mixed bag um, what I actually I don't want to shame anyone I've done plenty of poor observations myself in my life but you know how can we sort of increase the quality within iNaturalist um, uh, so that's why we created a special project. It's uh, the iNaturalist Fungal Diversity Database. Um, and the only way to get an observation in there is to do a high quality observation. Uh, when you first uh, join the project, you get instructions on how to make a good observations. We have a triager, the lovely Sam, who will reach out to you if your observations don't pass muster. She'll have um, you know, suggestions for you. Uh, she controls for quality. Um, and it's also a community. It's a community of several hundred people that we can activate around specific causes. If we wanted to look out for a specific uh, genus or species, we could activate that sort of uh, community in a heartbeat and they would all go out and look for it. So it's very useful. We haven't even fully used the powers of that community. So what's in it for the observer though, you ask? You're like, why should anybody contribute? What's the incentive? Well, if you post to this uh, INAT database, um, this INAT project, your uh, observation will be identified as, as much as we can, because obviously some fungi are hard to identify without looking at the spores or without a sequence, um, and potentially commented on by professional mycologists and highly ranked amateur identifiers. Um, but you're also doing a good thing. You're helping scientists and conservationists better understand and protect fungi by adding valuable high quality observations to this database. Um, so that's why, uh, you know, that's the incentive and that's why I, why I personally add uh, observations to the project. Um, and obviously you could say like every single mushroom should always have a voucher. Why don't you do DNA sequencing on every single mushroom that people find? And the reality is that's just not feasible for most people. There's not enough money. There's not enough time. Um, and a lot of mushrooms are actually identifiable by morphology alone. Um, you know, eBird, you don't always have a voucher with eBird either. That would be unethical. Um, so, you know, a lot of fungi can be re fairly reliably identified. Um, and that's what we try to do. Um, just to sort of end this section, um, we have, you know, we have small budgets, but big ambitions. We definitely want to do much more work with NatureServe, with state heritage programs, with parks and land managers to get rare and threatened fungi incorporated in their lists and management plans. Uh, having Greg Mueller on our board, uh, we're definitely going to be doing more work with the IUCN Red List Assessment Program. Uh, and we have a, sort of a, a loose uh, sort of partnership with the Fungi Foundation and Juliana Ferci and other organizations to, to include fungi uh, on conservation lists on par with plants and animals. Um, we also want to do much more partnerships with clubs. Clubs, we want to be the backbone of our conservation programs, and we're going to be doing a bunch of outreach over the next uh, few months. We already have partnerships with some clubs, um, and here's some of their logos. We want, you know, our dream is to establish and support club conservation coordinators. Uh, we want them to help with our uh, conservation initiatives. We want to provide materials and webinars. We want to help with campaigns for state fungus. I mean, several states are currently in the process of getting a state fungus approved. New York is one of them. And we want to help with that because it creates greater awareness of fungi. And we want to engage clubs to help with the red listing process. So those are some of our big dreams. Um, and, uh, you know, just quickly, what can you do? What can you as an individual do for conservation? Uh, first of all, documenting unusual collections really, really well on data on platforms like iNaturalist is a useful thing. Um, if you're so inclined, you could be doing DNA sequencing like I do, um, it's a hobby. And anybody who can cook off a recipe can do DNA sequencing. You could volunteer for a conservation nonprofit like Fundus. You could adopt a local park or area and become an expert on its fungal flora and their partners. That's something I'm very passionate about. You could encourage your club to get a permit to survey a high value threatened habitat for fungi, or you could nominate a potentially threatened species for red list assessment. Those are all just sort of large and small things. And then a final thing, what can, do, what can clubs do for conservation? So many clubs are sitting on amazing walk lists, like the New York Mycological Society has 10 years of lists and maybe more. That's really valuable, especially with climate change. 
uh, to have this historical database where you can see changes in distribution and incidence is really valuable. So if you can database them and make them accessible and analyze them, that's very valuable. Um, systematic check-ins into habitats with uh, rare and threatened fungi. If you have any in your area, obviously with permits for sequencing, vouchering, or, or merely documenting is very helpful. Um, participating in iNaturalist and data mining of your of club iNat data is valuable. And then finally, uh, some clubs do uh, sequencing, but they don't necessarily share the results. So making those uh, sequences publicly available is another thing that's helpful for conservation. So those just a few tips. Um, and this is where I'm going to hand it back to Bill, who's going to sort of tell you about the future of, of funders and what we have planned. Okay, are you going to keep the, the screen sacred? Okay. Okay, just to save time, keep it on Sigrid's computer. Thank you, Sigrid. That's great. To wrap up, uh, let's take a quick look at the future of Fundus. Uh, Fundus grants and paid general sequencing will continue this year, but new orders will cease to be accepted on April 30th, which is next Friday. Specimens must be received by November 30th, except spe specimens from Grant round four must be in by August 31st, as was made clear when they were given out. You know, we wish we could continue to offer general sequencing for amateurs, but we don't have the resources to do that. To continue offering general sequencing as we have, we probably need 50 to $100,000 uh, for hiring a coordinator and postdocs to do what Gene and Biddy are graciously doing for free right now, uh, among other things, uh, and tracking specimens and sequences. If you know of anybody with that kind of money, please send them our way. In the meantime, Fundus will target limited funds on sequencing rare, our limited funds on sequencing rare and threatened species and those from threatened habitats. We encourage project leaders to continue adding uh, observations to projects and add them to the diversity database. So next, there you go, oh, one back. You back up there. Yeah, that one. Um, so two commercial labs we know of that offer uh, full service for and are used to dealing with amateurs are Matt Gordon in Portland, Oregon and Pablo Alvarado with Alva Lab in Spain. A lot of uh, amateur mycologists have used both of those over the years and uh, they're, they do really good work. DIY sequencing, home sequencing uh, is an option. Uh, for clubs, perhaps, and this is something that more clubs might want to look into. Check out a document on our website uh, called DIY Barcoding Protocol, and you get some ideas of resources that are out there. And there's, there's usually one or two uh, enthusiastic high-tech people in, in various clubs that, that might uh, be able to do this. So the other thing to know is that the t technology of sequencing is constantly changing. And right now there's a lot of development in high throughput sequencing. And this could be become something that we could make available in, in the future when it becomes available. We've actually got a trial in progress right now with, with Bold. Uh, they're testing eight plates with one of these high throughput machines. So uh, promises dramatically lower costs. And I wanna stress again that Fundus does what we do with volunteers and with more volunteers, we can do a lot more. So under with the rare fungi challenges, we're looking for some, uh, somebody to work with Fundus to coordinate the coordinators and once we find that, and only once we find that, will we 
be going forward with some of the new rare challenges like Sigrid mentioned, there's interest in Alaska, Florida and some other places. But we need volunteers to do the, the pamphlets and put them up on the website. Fungal diversity database, we need more observers, uh, especially in certain parts of the, uh, identifiers rather in certain parts of the country. Uh, for, to do more with club conservation leaders, we really need a volunteer to again, be a coordinator of coordinators. And we're always looking for volunteers to, to help with our blog and newsletter, website updating and design, and beyond uh, what Biddy and Jean are doing now with screening DNA sequences, we will, to continue that, we're gonna need to find or, and train some people to do that next. So uh, if you want to join our band of volunteers, we would love to have you. Uh, finally, I want to hang on just one minute. So the ways you can contribute and uh, work with Fundus include the participating in the programs Sigrid was describing the diversity database and the rare fungi challenges. And the last slide I mentioned all, all the volunteer positions we would uh, like to find volunteers for. And here's a big one. We know that Fundus needs to transition to a staffed organization if we're going to achieve our goal of bringing fungus to the conservation table on a par with plants and animals. So if you believe that conserving fungi is important, you can help by helping us raise funds for staffing and enhanced programs. If you have any contacts or ideas, please contact one of us. Next. And finally, I want to acknowledge the hard work of all the incredibly talented and dedicated volunteers who are working now for fungal conservation. Here's some of them. And next questions. <laughs> 